All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our April Extension Master Gardener webinar. I am so pleased to see you all here this morning. Um, we just have a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, you can use the chat box to ask any questions, or you can unmute your mic um, or raise your hand, use the hand raise function, um, and we will... Um, Noah has agreed to answer those questions as they come up or any in the chat box. If we see them, we can get to them as they come up or leave them to the end. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our webinar archive. I will post that link in the chat box in just a moment. If you weren't able to attend last month's webinar, our March webinar has been posted to the webinar archive page and is now available for viewing and all of the related materials are also posted. So without anything else on our agenda for housekeeping, I would like to introduce Noah Bloom from Panorama Pay Dirt in Albemarle County. Um, their farm company works to promote soil fundamentals and help improve soils in central Virginia. Um, and we are really excited to have Noah join us here this morning. Noah, go ahead and, and take us off. Great, good morning. How's everybody doing today? I'm assuming that's good. Um, let me know if you can't hear me or uh, if you're having any any issues with audio or visual stuff. Um, uh, like Kathleen said, um, let me know if you guys have any questions. Just go ahead and feel free to put them in the chat or you can just chime in. Uh, I usually do these in person, kind of a, a little bit more conversational, less of a lecture, but we can do it however you guys want. So like I said, if you have any questions, um, just chime on in. Um, so yeah, so I work for Panorama Pay Dirt. It's a, a family composting business. Um, tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, our, uh, like we said, our mission is to promote soil fundamentals for the benefits of plants and people around them. Um, we've been around since uh, since 2001. This is a picture of our farm here in Albemarle County. Um, I don't know if any of you have uh, been here before. Um, Basically, we're an organization that was, uh, we're a farm that was doing traditional agriculture, cattle mostly, and uh, transitioned in 2001 to a, um, to a more sustainable, uh, sustainable endeavor in the compost business, something that would be good for, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit more longevity, a little bit less susceptible to market pressures than traditional agriculture. Um, so we started by taking leaves and brush from the city of Charlottesville and transitioning that into finished agricultural or horticultural materials, mostly mulch and compost. And uh, since then, we have uh, we have made something somewhere around 100,000 cubic yards or more. This uh, this slide's actually a little bit out of date. I think it's um, probably closer to 150. Um, at this point, um, we've diverted, you know, nearly 300,000 cubic yards of organic matter from Virginia landfills, um, something that we feel pretty strongly about. Um, there's really great sources of, of soil organic matter that we're just throwing in a landfill where it turns into methane, uh, which is a pretty gnarly greenhouse gas. Um, and we're doing our part to return that to the soil where it can benefit, uh, benefit plants. Um, and then we've also taken a ton of leaves, um, you know, in our opinion, the best thing to do with leaves is to leave them on the ground, uh, like they do in the woods, but that's not always possible everywhere. Um, but what a lot of people do is burn their leaves or they'll even bag them and put them in the, put them in the landfill. And again, we think that's a really terrible use of, uh, of the material. So, um, these are some of the things that we've done over the, over the last several years, um, which sort of brings us to the, the sort of the first problem that composting solves, uh, is the the waste management side of things. So um, this is a little bit out of date on our um, a little bit out of date for the uh, the data here, but it's something around you know almost a third or more of material that's going into the landfill in the United States uh, is something that should not be. Um, this is things like, uh, wood waste, like, you know, tree trimmings, yard trimmings. Um, food is another big component of that. You know, you buy strawberries at the store and you don't eat them and they get rotten and you throw them in the trash. Um, 
Meanwhile, like I said earlier, um, which, which I alluded to, when you're putting that carbonaceous material into the landfill, especially in absence of oxygen, um, you get a you get a lot of uh, a lot of methane production. So if any of you have ever been to a landfill, um, you'll see they've got these little vent tubes that are running up all throughout the site. And what those vent tubes are doing is they're they're venting the gases that build up, and in in some at lower concentrations, like two or three two or three percent. Um, they're permitted to just let that methane escape to the atmosphere, which is, of course, pretty gnarly, um, pretty pretty um, undesirable out, outlook, um, especially since methane is a very toxic um, greenhouse gas that's um, a lot more a lot more detrimental to our um, to our ozone layer than, say, carbon dioxide is. Um, if the methane percentage gets much higher, which happens in a lot of landfills, you'll actually see flames coming out where they'll have to light it. So they're basically burning the they're burning the methane. It's this continuous source of waste gas that they're burning to convert it into carbon dioxide, which is better than methane, but they're still just releasing that to the atmosphere. So what happens when you put too much organics into a landfill is you're basically just turning all that organic material directly into greenhouse gases. Um, which is not really a desirable thing. Some landfills they they can actually capture some of that methane and reuse it, which is a better, um, you know, a better solution. Um, it's still not not the greatest solution. Um, meanwhile, the other part of the the municipal waste side of things is just the trafficking. Um, you know, you have material that comes from Charlottesville that's going to a landfill in Amelia County or a landfill in Northern Virginia, where, uh, you know, you just have a lot a lot of miles. On, on this material, you have trash trucks that are driving around that are taking it to a transfer station where it's getting collected and then it's going off uh, to its final destination. So taking that third, that that 30% or so of material out of the landfill um, really, you know, reduces reduces traffic, reduces carbon, uh, carbon footprint of transportation, um, takes the gnarly gases out of the out of the equation. Um, so lots of states are dealing with that. Uh, by having a basically an organic legislation where they're preventing people from putting certain types of green wastes into landfills. Um, so you can see some of the some of the more um, aggressive states like California, um, some West Coast other West Coast states are banning uh, all food waste from going into the trash. That and what that really means is that the the cities and municipalities are doing municipal compost collection, which is a really great solution. Um, there are some yard waste bans in other places, various um, varying around the state. Right now, Virginia does not have an organics ban. Um, we'd really like it if they did um, because of all those reasons that I'm talking about. So, and then of course there's whole swaths of, in the middle of the country um, where uh, that's not happening as well. So um, lots of material going into landfill that's not really useful and shouldn't be there. Um, on the other side, when you're pulling the, that organic material out of out of the um, out of these out of the streams, uh, you, you can turn it into something that's really valuable. So the product that we focus up most of on mostly on is compost. Um, compost is uh, and we'll sort of get into the details of what that means uh, in some future slides, but basically. Um, Compost is the organic matter that could take years, you know, could take years to build up naturally in, say, a forest environment, or, um, or you know, grasslands places where there's lots of organic matter being returned to the soil. You can add compost to soil to um, to really really benefit the the ground. Um, I don't know how much of you guys have a background in soil science or or soil fundamentals. Um, basically, soil compri is comprised of a mineral content that's like rocks and, um, you know, very small rocks, uh, as small as clay, and basically. Um, there's a, uh, there is um, a empty space, um, usually taken up by air, but often by water as well. Uh, there's a biological component of soil. That's all the sort of microbes and things that are living there. And then there's the organic component, and the organic component being carbonaceous material, usually from the decomposition of plants and animals, mostly plants. Uh, so when you have, you know, you have a forest where the leaves are falling every year as the leaves rot, that soil matter gets brought down into the soil or as say earthworms go and they, they 
eat the eat the leaf litter and they go down into the soil uh, when they're they're basically depositing that soil that organic matter throughout the soil. Similarly, in something like the grasslands, where the grass roots are maybe 10 or 20 feet deep, um, as the grass roots die and regrow every year, that dead root matter um, decomposes into organic matter, into generic organic matter, which is why, so say, in the Midwest of the United States, there's, you know, 20 feet of dark brown topsoil. Um, so adding compost to more of a depleted soil, like we have in lots of places of Virginia, can can add that organic matter directly to the plants, uh, directly to the soil. Um, so some of the benefits of that is it improves the soil structure, like I said. Um, things like clay compounds really like to stick together. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with um, the red clay we have in Charlottesville. Um, basically what the compost will do is it can form, it can form um, little rings around individual components of clay which prevents them from sticking together, which makes your sort of hard pan, basically brick soil into more of a draining, uh, well aerated soil. Um, another thing that compost is really good at is a buffering your pH. Um, again, in lots of places, um, I guess it depends on where you are in the state, but uh, say in Charlottesville, um, especially some of our, you know, really heavily worked, uh, heavily worked sites, uh, places where the sub, where the top, Topsoil has been stripped and we're down to subsoil. Your pH could be, you know, something like four and a half or five. Um, just these very weathered, old, tired soils. Um, so, you know, every year people come and they dump lime down, but it rains a lot and it rinses, rinses out. We're putting a lot of fertilizer down, which, which can drive this, the soil pH further down. Um, so having that compost layer really kind of helps you keep your soil pH at a more desirable level, which of course um, benefits plants that, that like that more um, more neutral soil, something like six, six and a half. Um, there's, um, I, I, I talked about how the, the organic matter can kind of wrap around um, elements of clay or um, compounds of clay. Uh, one of the things that they can also do is help exchange soil nutrients. That's called the cation exchange capacity, uh, which basically is the, you know, it's the, it's the definition of Sure, you have these particular uh, minerals and uh, compounds in your soil that your plants need. How quickly can the plants get it, or how easily can the plants get it? Versus the clay, the clay, um, clay structure sort of holding on to those minerals. Um, then um, there's a lot of biological, a lot of biological benefits as well to compost. Um, like I said, nutrient cycling, um, and um, just the the increase in your soil biome. Uh, one of the interesting things that we see on our site, uh, we do a lot of compost on bare ground. And uh, in the wintertime, we'll pick up a pile or we'll basically sell a pile, pick it up, whatever, move it out of the way. And if you sort of squint really, really um, closely, you can see a sort of a black outline where that compost pile was. Meanwhile, fast forward to the wintertime you get an eighth of an inch of snow or you get a heavy frost in the morning, just a really light layer. And everything on the ground is white or crystal where you can see all of the, all of the, uh, all of the frost. And then that outline, there's a circular outline where the compost pile was, where, the, where it won't freeze. And the reason that it doesn't freeze is because all of that living matter that's inside, that was inside the compost is in those top few inches of soil. And the act, the biological activity, just the act of microbes moving around, doing their thing, creates heat and creates just enough heat to get over that threshold of, you know, 31 degrees to 30, 33 or 34. Um, so it's sort of a really interesting look at, um, you know, just the, just the biological activity that's happening. Um, let's see. So brings us to the question of what is compost? Um, there's a lot of different different definitions. Some people some people say their compost is oh I take all my food scraps and I throw them in a pile in the backyard, and you know twice a week my dog chases a raccoon out of there and it smells kind of bad. And in the spring I dig it up and I spread it on my garden. Uh, that's really not uh, in our definition not not be considered uh, proper compost. True compost is an aerobic process. Um, this is a process that is. Um, this is a process that is in the presence of oxygen. So that means that as the microbes are consuming the material, the raw material that you would put into it, 
Um, they're creating a lot of carbon dioxide. They are um, they're ingesting a lot of oxygen, and they're, so they're basically replacing all that oxygen with carbon dioxide. If it's not structured well, if it's not if it doesn't breathe, or you're not turning it or flipping it over frequently, um, what'll happen is it'll start to smell sour. Um, it'll start to go through what's called an anaerobic an anaerobic digestion, basically, which drops the pH dramatically, creates a lot of malodorous compounds, um, creates things like methane and other other gases um, that are a lot less desirable. Um, and also it just can be kind of gross. Um, if some of you look because they have a have a home compost set up, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, the other thing that compost is compost is a lot. Um, it's really, this is really a, uh, a living product. Um, the running joke is not that we make compost, but we, we basically, uh, feed microbes. We, we take, we take these raw products, we process them in a way that the microbes can digest it properly, can consume it properly. And then we're sort of harvesting the output of that process. Um, uh, with that alive, um, like I was alluding to before, there is a temperature component. Um, so as the compost starts to do its thing, it starts to get pretty warm and then it starts to get really warm and it starts to get actually hot. Um, proper compost is made um, somewhere around the 130 to 170 degree temperature range in Fahrenheit. Uh, that's something that um, if you're not reaching those temperatures, um, you're really not making a kind of product that, uh, that, that has all the benefits that we're talking about today. Um, the other components of that it is, is it is pretty stable. Um, so there is this sort of heating period where you're, um, where you're making your compost, but the compost, the finished compost that you would have would be considered finished. Uh, that material is going to be relatively cool. Uh, it's not going to be super aggressive. It's not going to starve your plants of nutrients. It's not going to outgas everything. everything. Um, it should also be weed and pathogen free. I mean, again, that sort of comes with the heat element. Um, things like weed seeds, um, plant diseases, other things like that are, are generally killed at uh, in that 130 degree range. Um, there's obviously, it's, it's living, so you're not, this is not a sterile product. We think of it more of like Kind of like a pasteurization or like a flash pasteurization, um, where we're not trying to get this sterile. There's no life at all. We're just trying to get above that threshold where some of the some of the more noxious vectors can be taken care of. Um, compost also can be variable. There's lots of different types of compost. You can make it from lots of different things. There's compost that you have to be really careful how much you put in it because it's very high in certain certain materials, like maybe it's really high in phosphorus or really high in potassium. Uh, so if you put too much of it down year and year and year and year in, um, you could look at having you know higher levels of these unwanted chemicals. Um, things like heavy metals can be an issue in compost where if you're using from certain feedstocks, uh, there's actually legal limits as to how much compost you would wanna put down. Um, there's some compost that's relatively devoid of minerals uh, and and micronutrients and is mostly just carbon. Um, you know, a lot of the food waste or a lot of the yard waste compost that are just made of wood chips, basically. Um, that material can be really great organic matter, but without some of the other components that you're looking at. Um, so how do we make compost? Um, you're looking at uh, this is a pretty rough recipe, um, but essentially carbon or carbonaceous materials and nitrogenous or nitrogen containing materials. Uh, these are the real big components that um, that compost piles need. Um, the other things that you're that are not necessarily listed on this list is water. Water is a huge part of compost. Um, the composting. Uh, Will consume a lot of water. So if you're if you're uh, if you're doing composting at home, for example, uh, you do need to make sure that your that your pile is well watered uh, because the microbes they're living creatures just like just like us. Um, maybe not just like us, but similar to us. 
and uh, they consume a lot of, they're consuming the material and they're consuming a lot of the water along with that. Um, the, the other component that's not on here, like I said, is oxygen um, or air. And uh, those two materials are sort of the difference between your, um, you know, your commercial compost that's a, in a giant pile that's breathing and is aerated and we turn it and it's, you know, we can make compost in 60 days, start to finish, and your home composting in your backyard, that's just kind of a slimy, wet mess. Um, so the carbon to nitrogen ratio should be somewhere around, uh, somewhere around, I think it's like 60 or 70 percent by mass, by, um, by, we, we do it, uh, in the industry, we do it by, um, like, stoichiometric, ratios. So basically it's something we wanted to start in the 25, 25 or 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, which it doesn't really work out in the math of like a pound of leaves versus a pound of nitrogen material. And also the how much nitrogen sort of matters. So something like leaves have mostly carbon, some nitrogen, something like wet grass would have lots of nitrogen, some carbon, um, things like poultry litter, or, um, or uh, yeah, pol poultry litter or swine manure. Those are gonna be really high in nitrogen, pretty low in carbon. Materials like wood chips, um, wood chips or bark, uh, those are really high in nitrogen, very low in nitrogen. And there are, there are calculators out there where uh, you can basically, you can, um, you can target a ratio of those materials to try and get the optimal uh, optimal mix based on what you have. So let's say, you know, a, a really common household composting could be, for example, you have a relationship with an arborist who brings you wood chips and you also want to compost your food waste. So you kind of know what your food waste, you, food waste is very variable depending on, you know, what kind of household you have. Uh, food waste can also contain things like paper towels or, or tissues that are really high in carbon, have very little nitrogen. Um, you could also be, you know, you could be running a, um, you know, a barbecue restaurant and have a lot of meat and table scraps and bones and other things, uh, which is obviously going to have a different, uh, a different makeup than someone who's a vegetarian. And the only thing they have is, you know, vegetable trimmings. Um, so sort of, uh, so taking those materials, let's say you would mix the, you would mix the wood chips with your food waste. Um, that would be the kind of material that would be the kind of uh, you'd want to get that ratio right because you want, you know, if you have too much nitrogen going in, what will happen is the compost pile will get will either get really it'll get really hot and it'll actually smell like ammonia. Um, you're and, and then you're basically when you're smelling ammonia, you're putting off all this nitrogen and you're wasting that nitrogen that could be used to break down other other carbon material. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have enough nitrogen in your pile, you're going to have, um, you're basically going to be pretty slow. Um, it's going to take a lot longer for those, for that carbon material to break down. Um, the other side of that, uh, the other component of that is uh, that nitrogen is a real driver of heat along with oxygen and water. So if you don't have enough nitrogen, what will happen is your pile uh, your pile, even if it's well aerated, like wood chips are really, really good for aeration. Um, but uh, if you don't have enough nitrogen, the pile won't get hot enough. And then when it doesn't get hot enough, it doesn't breathe as well. It doesn't break stuff down. You're going to be left with things like weed seeds, um, potentially plant pathogens. You know, if you're the kind of person who's composting, say, peonies, um, you know, you cut your peonies down every year. And you take your you take your moldy, dirty, gross peony leaves, and you put them in the compost pile. It gets to ninety five degrees in six months. You turn it around, uh, you turn it over. It looks like compost. It's great. You spread it underneath your peonies. Meanwhile, you're just taking you know a whole season's worth of peony peony um, fungus and uh, and mildews and whatever, and you're putting them back in your plants. And you're just sort of recycling that that plant pathogen vector as opposed to 
bringing in a, a cleaner material. So a lot of places, like if you're reading gardening books, will say, don't compost peony leaves, don't compost rose leaves. Um, you know, these are some of these some of these disease prone plants um, where, uh, you know, and the reason they're saying that is because your typical home composting is not reaching those temperatures that you want. And so all you're doing is just reintroducing these diseases back into your garden. Um, so uh, when you're done with your compost, um, basically the pile on the left is, is a look at sort of a, um, you know, Instagram worthy, this is my compost pile. I think in reality, most compost feedstocks don't look quite as pretty as those. Um, but um, you can see there's some, some sticks and twigs, some leafy material. Um, some things are maybe a little bit more green. Um, you see there's some mulch, pine, other things like that in there. Um, you can see on the right, there's a holly. Um, there's some holly berries. So yeah, you can put something like seeds. I don't know how many of you have put um, have done home composting and then you spread it out the next year and you said, oh, look, I've got volunteer squash everywhere. It's great. Uh, the reason that you have a, the squash there is because the squash plants went into the, the squash seeds went into the compost, didn't reach the heat cycle. And, uh, and then of course there's still viable seeds. And so when you put them in your garden, they germinate. Um, here on the right, this is what our, our finished compost looks like. Um, you can see it's basically unrecognizable. Um, you can see it's sort of vaguely it's vaguely botanical. You can see some some of the longer twigs, like the like the leaf petioles, um, the longer stems. You can see, okay, this might have come from a leaf. Um, this might have had some some twiggy, sticky parts. But you couldn't look at this and say, oh, that's an oak leaf. That's a uh, you know that's a holly berry. Um, these are the kinds of this is the kind of transformation that you're that you're looking for. Um, so we talked a little bit about the temperature. Um, this is this is sort of the science of how the temperature works. Um, this is basically one curl, one curve. Um, you can you can repeat this cycle multiple times, uh, depending on exactly how it's going. But essentially, um, most composting is done in a batch, where um, you know starting on day zero you've got your pile, you've got your feedstocks. And then once you start this process, you really don't wanna introduce anything else to that process because, uh, because you're, every time you add something to your compost pile, it has to go through this whole process. It's gotta go through the, the pasteurization, essentially, um, the, the sort of sterilization pasteurization step. Um, it's gotta go through the breakdown to become unrecognizable. Um, and so if you add something, say, you know, after you drop below that 131 degree rate, um, you're basically starting over from scratch. So in the in the business, we're we're permitted. Um, it's a heavy regulated industry. We're waste management um, operators. Um, so our permits require that our compost is at 131 degrees for uh, for 15 days straight in in our um, in our windrows. Windrow is basically we take our compost, we put it about seven or eight feet high, eight feet high, about 10 or 12 feet wide, and then we just do it in a long row. And then we have a we have a machine that runs behind and turns the row as it travels past it. And we also do static piles. Static pile is just a giant heap, basically as high as you can pile it. We get to something like 20 feet tall by, so it's probably 20 feet tall by maybe 20 feet wide by 20 feet long. Um, and you put that in a giant pile, and when it's in that giant pile, you don't turn it, you don't manipulate it at all. Um, and those in those piles, we required 131 for three days. Um, but basically, that 131 temperature is kind of your kind of your magic. Um, that's the number at which most plant pathogens die, where most weed seeds are killed. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, what can happen is when you're in this quest to get really hot, you you build up a pile that's got really good airflow. It's got a plenty of nitrogen. You got a lot of water. Everything's going well. Meanwhile, your pile can go. Okay, oh great, we're at 131. Oh, we're at 141. Oh wait, we're at 151. Wait, we're at 160, 170. Now we're at 180. We've got this giant pile that's 15 feet tall at 180 degrees as it starts to rise in temperature. Um, it can actually catch on fire. 
Um, this is a pretty major issue at, say, mulch yards, places in the country that, that make a lot of mulch. Um, they can run into issues where um, they basically build the piles too too high, and they'll do it in the winter time when it's cold and everything is everything's fine. Then in the springtime, the temperature starts to warm up, and they get a good rain. Meanwhile, the water really activates everything, and it starts to get warmer. All of a sudden, the pile starts to heat up, and it can catch on fire. Um, those mulch piles can actually smolder for months or years. Uh, and what happens is if you break it open to try to deal with it or you put water on it to try to put it out, it actually gets worse because you're now just exposing more oxygen. You're giving it more water. Um, and so it's really um, a pretty dangerous thing to have happen. So we, we um, most of our commercial work is around preventing fire. Uh, but basically how, we're, how we talk about, how we think about the temperature is, um, so we start at sort of ambient temperature on day zero. Uh, that's just the temperature of the material when it comes in. Uh, meanwhile, it starts to heat up and we get into this sort of mesophilic, mesophilic range where uh, the, the, the microbes, most of which are fungal or bacterial, um, they start to sort of do their thing and they start to, to consume the material consume the water, um, consume the oxygen, release carbon dioxide. As they start to become active, uh, they start to replicate. As they replicate, they get uh, they create more heat. And as they create more heat, the temperature rises. Um, at about the, the um, as it starts to get into the 100, 105, 110 degree range, um, those meso mesophilic uh, microbes really start to, to tail off. They actually start to die. Um, so they begin to die. And then an, another set of microbes that was just sort of hanging out dormant, these thermophilic microbes take over. So once you reach that 105, 110 degree range, the thermophilic uh, microbes, which are the super, super active ones, they take off and then your temperature just, just soars. So as soon as you can, you can crest that initial bump, um, your temperature generally will go way, way up. Once it goes way up, it starts to go, it peaks, like I said, depending on how large your pile is, um, usually peaks at around 160 degrees. Um, if you're getting to 160 degrees, what you really wanna do is turn it um, so you can flip it or, or break it open to get it to, to get the temperature to drop. It will drop on its own. Um, so what happens is as it gets too hot and as it gets too, um, too much um, carbon dioxide buildup, it'll actually, the microbes will start to die and it'll tail down. Then as it starts to go down, it becomes more favorable and they start to come up again. And again, as you're reaching that 130, 140 degree temperature range, that's when things are starting to die. So that's when you see those bumps there in the um, in that hot phase. Um, so the timing that that could happen, um, you know, in our in our commercial facility, we're looking at, you know, we're hitting that 150 to 100 and 140, those there's like 10, 15 degree temperature swings. We're hitting those weekly. Basically, every time you turn it, the temperature will drop and then it'll rise back up and we'll turn it again and it'll drop back down. Um, we'll turn our piles anywhere from, you know, 15 to 30 times uh, during that phase. Um, and that could be as long as, you know, three or four months, um, three or four months where it can stay above that 130 degree range. Uh, once that material starts to sort of tail off and starts to cool, um, it'll gradually, it'll gradually, um, temperature will gradually decline. You can still turn it at this point, which is sort of good to fluff it and air it out. Uh, meanwhile, as you start to turn it, you're also breaking up chunks that maybe didn't get all the compost. Maybe you're adding some water. Um, so you can get some, you can, it's not always just a smooth downhill slope. You can get some, um, you can get a lot of, uh, temperature bumps depending on, you know, this is, this is sort of theoretical, but um, you get these, you get these temperature bumps as you start to break it up. And then that curing phase really goes anywhere from, you know, 60 to 90 days or longer. Um, that's when you want a lot of those gases to escape. You want it to sort of become a lot more stable. So now you can put it on your ground, you put it, put it on the ground and use it for, um, use it for whatever application that you were looking for. Um, the other thing that we that's not on this that we that we do in our facility is we screen our compost. Um, so let's say you know in an ideal world everything is 100% composted. So you know you take a you take a cow bone that's that's three feet long by you know four inch diameter and you put it in your compost pile. It's going to break down. In an ideal compost facility, um, it would disappear completely. 
in a home compost, maybe not so much. Maybe you're left with something, maybe breaks into two or three smaller pieces and that first round of composting doesn't take care of it all. So we would screen through, you know, a half inch or a three quarter inch um, steel grate. Uh, we have a giant machine that can do it, but you can do it at home with like a box and some hardware cloth. Uh, and you can sort of shake through and pull out any unwanted material. So if you said, oh, look, there's a bunch of bottle caps that got in there. How'd those get there? I don't know. Pull them out, throw them in the trash. Uh, but let's say you have bones or you have sticks or you have other other things that were, um, you know, that were not composted uh, fully, you can screen those out and then throw those in to your next batch and then um, hope that on the second or third pass that they would compost completely. Um, so yeah, so composting can be done at home. This is a, this is a really great, um, a great way to learn about, uh, to learn about how these things work but also how, you know, how to keep materials out of the landfill. Um, the sort of running, the running um, thing that I like to say is that your trash shouldn't smell. Um, if your trash smells, it means that you're putting a lot of carbonaceous material that's rotting in your trash that you then take the landfill or whatever. Uh, but when you put it in your compost bin, your compost bin uh, takes that and absorbs that rotting material and turns it into something more useful. Um, so, of course, this picture is pretty, um, uh, obviously, the start of a composting process. It would be hard for something to look exactly like this, um, but it could happen. Um, it's certainly not going to look like that after a while. Um, uh, so this is also an interesting one because you do see how the material is pretty commingled uh, and it's all recognizable. This is, a, in this type of pile, this is something that I would want to mix pretty thoroughly. Um, and I'd want to mix it pretty continually. Um, you know, there's a lot of those materials, um, you know, that that rotting carrot is not going to um, not going to compost as well if it's not sort of distributed in and amongst some more carbon material. Um, so, again, um, going back to the recipe, that's sort of the first thing that you wanted to start with with your home composting setup. Um, this is, um, like I said, I can point you all to some some resources for uh, for recipe builders if you want. Um, the volume really matters. Uh, we're talking about the heat that's created from our compost, and really the reason for that heat is it's not that one microbe is doing a lot of work and spewing off a bunch of heat. It's the collective of efforts of all these different um, microbes doing their work. And the more volume you have in your pile, the more microbes there are, the more um, the more heat that gets created. Meanwhile, the material itself acts as a heat sink, which retains heat. So if you have a pile that's large enough, <laughs> uh, if you have a if you have a, a pile that's large enough, um, this is something that can can be done um, that really holds holds that heat. Um, odors, if you're doing it correctly, odors should be a non-issue. Uh, if you're doing a commercial composting operation like we do, odors are a bigger deal um, because, you know, we're receiving, you know, hundreds of cubic yards of poultry litter, for example, which can smell pretty, pretty gross. Um, vectors, this is again something that's just handled by the temperature. Um, by the temperature, uh, if you're reaching those, if you're reaching those those temperatures of 130 degrees, you're going to take care of a lot of that. Um, attention, your home compost pile. This is not something that you have to turn once a week or once a month. Uh, it's something that could be done, you know, two or three times a year, two or three times a season, sort of depending on your your level of uh, level of expertise. Um, the good news is that compost can basically always recover. So even if it goes anaerobic or it gets too wet or too gross, um, if you can if you can manipulate it to get it back to where it was uh, originally, then then everything uh, everything can come together nicely. Um, seasonality is a is a big part of it as well. Um, it's just really hard. It's harder to do it in the winter time when it's cold, especially if it's cold and wet. Um, that moisture can really dry things out. So, um, yeah, I'm seeing some comments that this looks like uh, looks difficult for one person to manage. 
it's really not that hard. Um, this is something that, you know, I think the most successful things that I've seen are like a bit of chicken wire, a four foot high piece of chicken wire wrapped in a four foot circle. Uh, you take your material in a wheelbarrow, something that you'd want to mix, mix it up really well and put it into the wheelbarrow or put it into your, um, into your chicken wire housing. Um, you know, looking at a picture like here on the, on the slide, um, one thing that sort of my complaint about this style of compost is there's really nowhere for air to get in. Um, this is a material that wants to really breathe. And so wrapping it in this black plastic really doesn't help, um, doesn't help that process. So you're probably likely to fail in this scenario like this. Wrapping something in chicken wire, you're going to, um, you're, you're having all that room on the side for the, for the material to breathe. Uh, so if you take you take that chicken wire, Rick, maybe put down like, I don't know, two or three inches of wood chips on the bottom to give you something to, to breathe from the bottom and then mix all your material in a wheelbarrow and fill that up. If you can fill four four foot circle of chicken wire with compost material and then water it, uh, if you water it and get it, have a, have a right starting materials, you can get working compost. You can get working temperature, that 130 degrees, you can get there in, you know, two to three days, one, sometimes even one or two days, depending on what the material is. Once you're at that 130 degree temperature, you can just leave it. Um, you don't have to do anything with it. It's already going to reach that temperature where the, where the things are going to break down. Uh, you can come back and check on it. If you're really interested, you can check it daily. If you're, in, if you're less interested, you can check it once or twice a week or, or less than that. If you just want this material to go away, uh, you can come back and check on it in six months and see what it looks like. If you've hit that temperature, uh, once you hit that temperature, it's gonna do its thing and it's just gonna slowly, gradually take care of itself. Um, so um, yeah, at this point, this is basically all I've got for, um, for uh, slide discussions. Um, so I see that we're starting to have some questions come in. Um, so now's a, now's a good time for, General questions. Um, so uh, looks like somebody asked, I've got three wooden bin, wooden three bin compost structure. How does that work? Um, so I, I'm not quite sure I know what you mean. You have three separate bins that are that are separated from each other. No. Um... Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Yeah, uh, no, it's there. Uh, three wooden bins that mm -hmm. are attached to each other, and the boards come. Can, you can slide them out so you can get to the compost. Uh huh. And slide them back in, and um, I got this last year, and I've I've been putting stuff in, but I, I don't have compost anywhere near compost. Mm -hmm. I um, I'm just kind of, you know, stumped with how do I make this into good, rich compost I can use mm -hmm. in my garden? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, um, so I, I would say, I would say the volume is kind of the biggest solution. Um, if you can get, if you can get it, if you can get enough material into these bins, I don't know if that means removing this, the sliding pieces to get it, to get it all unified. Um, again, there, there is this concept of batching where you basically put all of your material in at once and it all composts at the same time. Um, so it's sort of going leading into James's question next of, you know, how do you deal with the fact that you're bringing material in daily? <laughs> but yeah. basically, so what you would do is you would have a sort of a collection spot where you can collect your material, say, in a plastic bin where it can rot and be smelly and you don't care what happens to it. Um, that material you can hold on to for as long as you need. Meanwhile, when you have enough of it, you could go put it in your three bin, your three bin setup, something where you can get as much of it in as possible. And then from start to finish, you get that material composting. Meanwhile, while you're doing your active composting, you can be collecting and stockpiling other things. And then uh, when that's when your compost in your wooden bins is finished, you would pull it out, you use it in the garden if you can. Uh, or, and then you bring the other material in to, uh, to work, to work with it. Um, it's kind of a balance because on the one hand, you're trying to get, like I said, that sort of four foot by four foot, um, 
or the the four foot um, four cubic whatever that however the math works on that the four foot cylinder that that size is kind of as far as I'm concerned it's sort of the smallest that I would deal with if you're dealing with anything smaller than that that's probably why you're having issues like is it is it, is the stuff you're dealing with cold when you put it in cold. or when it when it when it's com when you when it's composting is it cold uh pretty much yeah I and you know I I watched a video on YouTube that said you do you layer brown and green brown mm -hmm. and green you know and I've been getting uh, coffee grounds from um, Starbucks. Mm -hmm. And um, during during the winter, I did that because there wasn't that much green. And I know coffee is green. And um, uh, and then leaves. I've been doing a lot of leaves and mm -hmm. vegetable scraps. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, I'm wondering, do, do I have the three bins so I can turn it by taking it out of the first bin and turning it into the second bin yeah that's that was one thought that i had i mean i have to i probably have to see exactly what you're talking about okay the other thing that you could do with a three bin system if you had them large enough is that the three bins would be for your batching right so you could be gathering material in say bin one and right. you're just throwing stuff in every day right you throw stuff in and it just kind of sits there it's not doing much maybe right. it's a little smelly whatever nobody cares then once you have enough material, you would then add wood chips, you would stir it with a pitchfork, water it, and now you say this one is off limits. Now you go to bin two. In bin two, you start collecting your stuff every day. I Meanwhile, see. you go and manage bin one. I see. Then, then um, once bin two is full, then you take bin two, you say, all right, bin two is now actively composting, add your leaves or whatever, stir it, add some water. Now that's actively composting. Meanwhile, you're now checking on one and two, you go to bin three, you start to collect material there. By the time bin three is ready to collect material, in, of course, in theory, bin one should be ready. Uh, of course, this is an ideal world, you know, a lot of factors, but assume that bin one is ready, you pull bin one out, it looks awesome. You you take it, you screen it, whatever material didn't get finished composting, you put back into bin one. You take all your finished compost, spread it on your garden. Now bin one is where you're collecting stuff. As okay. by the time bin one is done, bin two is ready, et cetera. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, yeah, so I think I got James's question about, um, how to manage a, manage a plastic container. James, you asking like, how do you get it from being gross and smelly? Hey, sorry. I was trying to get unmuted. Yeah, no worries. Um, so when you're adding small amounts, you were saying you may not get the heat that you need. So I was just curious, um, how, is, it, is it, if you're just adding, you know, kitchen scraps and leaves every single day, how long will it take it, it to build up and get the temperatures you need? Yeah, so I mean, it's really, it's kind of difficult. That's what I was saying that you should do is just sort of stockpile those until you can get to that sort of four foot, that four foot range. So basically not be worried about not hitting temperature yet. Um, basically you'll hit temperature when you have enough material. So stockpiling that material as long as you can uh, to keep the material, um, to keep your, keep your materials uh, until you have enough of them to do your, to do your stuff. Uh, so if that means that it's gonna be kind of punky, maybe you got a lot of flies, something else there's some strategies for for you know dealing with rotting material that's not an active composting but basically i would suggest you know taking a something like a bin system where you could just you know throw some leaves or wood chips something that would absorb some liquid from it um it can just be sort of in passive compost until you have enough material and then i would go ahead and start batching if that makes sense great thank you mm -hmm. Uh, okay, looks like uh, 
Ben has a question about uh, digestants or accelerators. Um, I, um, my opinion is that everything, basically nature, nature abhors a vacuum, right? Uh, everything, everything in life has the microbes on it to break it down. Um, if you have, you know, you leave a strawberry on the counter for a few days, it's going to get moldy. If you leave a piece of bread, uh, you leave a piece of bread in a bag, it's going to mold and it's going to rot. Um, so those, I think those products are are kind of snake oil. Um, if you put a bunch of material together in a pile, it's going to rot. Uh, once it rots, you're going to start that material. You're going to start that process. Um, the only thing that I would say is if you're really dealing with like sterile materials, um, you know, especially if you're like in a super industrial facility, if you're dealing with like, you know, a tractor trailer full of uh, of like paper pulp from a paper mill something like that, or, or newspaper, you know, something, something that would be sort of a more commercial product, less of a, um, less of a, you know, sort of diversified household waste. Um, you might want to look into something like that, but I would say for home use is totally unnecessary. We had a question come in earlier about landfills, mm -hmm. about the methane vent tubes. So the question, mm -hmm. are the methane vent tubes at landfills permanent fixtures? And how do landfills know if they might need to light the methane vent tubes on fire? Like, how are they monitoring that output percentage? Yeah, so that um, there, I'm a, I'm not a landfill operator, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm um, I'm trained in some of that. Um, so basically, those are permanent fixtures. Those are built into the landfill. Um, the way that a landfill works is you basically build, um, you put a drainage, you put a drainage. Um, material drain tiles basically with a pump system so as liquid goes and it drains down out of the landfill it's collected in a it's basically wrapped in plastic with a drain tile so it collects that moisture as the moisture falls it's pumped back into the top of the landfill and then meanwhile as they're building these um as they're building these individual they call them a lift in a landfill a lift is basically one day's worth of landfilling so at the end of each day they fill it with some kind of cover um, usually like wood chips or something like that. Um, but it can be topsoil or other things as well. Uh, so they take this uh, and they, um, they as they build those in, they put the pipes into vent. And then when they're done, they cap it off and they, the, um, the tubes are there. And then part of the running a land, of a landfill, part of the operation of a landfill is um, daily daily monitoring. So they're monitoring... Um, they put wells, they dig wells all around that monitor for um, leachate. If there's any leachate from the landfill that's getting into the groundwater, they would be testing those wells at regular periods to make sure that there's nothing contaminating the water supply. Um, and then they're also testing um, using various tools, um, testing what's coming out of those pipes. So if there is enough concentration of methane coming out of the pipe, they would be obligated to burn it. Um, the other thing is you also can't burn it if it's not high enough. Um, so you're really only burning it if it's if it's really high concentrations of methane. Uh, let's see. Um, so somebody does say um, they don't put meat, seeds, or potatoes in the compost. Um, yeah, I mean, anything that you put in the compost is a vector for something to come and consume it. Um, a lot of people say don't put meat in your compost because, uh, you know, it's just sort of one of those rules that's thrown around a lot. Um, I will say that meat is 100% compostable and it's great compost. Um, the problem is that if you have, especially if you're, you know, batching a lot of material, you're collecting material for a month, having rotting meat in your backyard might not be the best solution. So that's why, that's why people shy away from using meat in a compost. Um, but it's sort of gotten the illusion that you can't compost meat, um, which is completely false. Um, so yeah, if you basically, once you get to that active compost, you can put anything. I mean, you can compost, you know, people compost roadkill, for example, um, and you can put an entire, you know, an entire dead deer in a compost pile and in, you know, three months it will be gone. Um, it's a pretty incredible process. Uh, let's see. Um, Newspaper, is newspaper or shredded office paper considered to be brown or green? Um, I would consider that to be brown. Um, 
again, that brown green, it's it's kind of a rough, it's a rough guess. Um, if you really wanted to be scientific, you'd find out what the carbon and nitrogen ratio for each of those materials is. Like I said, most things have a mix of both. Um, I believe paper, you know, pure wood or paper like that is going to be almost entirely carbon. So definitely be brown. Um, all right, we've got another question about bleached paper. Um, a lot of um, the inks, actually, I think most inks that people are using are soy based in things like newspaper. Um, I'm not sure about cardboard um, or or things like a cereal box, like a glossy paper. Um, I don't really know off the top of my head. I'd have to do a little more research on that. Um, I'd say when in doubt, don't put it in your compost. Um, but also, especially for something, you know, something like cardboard or commercial paper sources, there's a good, um, there's good uh, regular recycling options for that as well. So if you're, if you're recycling, you know, if you're recycling, local recycling center will take cardboard, I would suggest just doing that instead of doing home compost. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the general rule to think about is, you know, conservation of, of matter, right? If you have, if you have a piece of cardboard that's full of heavy metals that you don't know about, or for whatever reason, let's say they're using a lead-based ink, I don't know. If you put that material into your compost pile, like your compost pile is going to have lead in it. Um, that's, just the way that's the way things work you know nothing nothing is destroyed in the compost no, no elements are destroyed in the composting process some things can leach out like nitrogen can leach out in the rain or nitrogen can leave as a gas um as well as you know carbon can leave as a gas uh but um yeah anything you put into your compost pile is going to end up in your compost pile um or in the air around you so or water or whatever so definitely take care to know what you're putting in and when in doubt, don't put it in your compost pile. I think that's a that's a general rule in recycling in general. Like there's a big trend where people will put, you know, I don't know if this is recyclable or not, so I'll put it in the bin. And that's actually one of the worst things that you can do. Um, if you're not sure if something is, a, is an acceptable material, um, the general, the, once you put it into the process, it's hard to pull it out. So that includes something like, you know, elemental lead in your compost pile or, you know, a number five plastic and a number two plastic recycling bin. Um, any other questions? I've, I've got some time. I don't know how, how tight of a uh, schedule you guys are on, but I can stick around if there's any more. And wait another minute to see if there's any other questions that come through to the chat box. But uh, just as a reminder, this recording will be posted to our webinar archive. Uh, we try to get that up since these webinars are at the end of the week um, by early the next week. Um, so do keep an eye out for that and feel free to share with other master gardeners who might be interested. And it looks like one other question just came through, Noah. Yeah. So um, let's see. We've got um, human urine and pet waste. Um, yeah, you can totally compost those. Um, I, uh, so one thing that's done really, really frequently is um, a lot of biosolids get turned into compost in a, um, uh, for example, at like a municipal water supply um, recycling center, they'll take, they call them an anaerobic digester. So they take all, everything that comes out of a sewer, they put in these giant digesters, these big round um, round materials. And those, those actually go through an anaerobic process where the pH gets down to like two or two and a half. Um, it creates a large amount of methane that they can either capture or burn. Um, and then, but, but part of that, getting that pH down really low, that kills a lot of the human vectors. Um, you know, things like human born viruses and some other, some other things that we don't need to be, um, that they don't need to be putting back into the soil. Um, or just exposing people to um, the material that's that's left as the result of that is a they call it like a biosolids or a sludge. Um, they spread it out over um, they spread it out in large concrete blocks to aerate or to dry out. And that's why if you go by it's like a water treatment facility, it can smell pretty disgusting. Um, meanwhile, that material is totally benign. Um, you know, wouldn't recommend eating it, but it's probably safe to eat. Um, I mean, that's how that's how benign it is. 
Um, and then that product is often becomes a um, feedstock of an additional composting process. So as far as like materials are concerned, um, you can certainly, you know, those, those, um, those things make good compost. Um, the concern that I would have you doing it at home would just be, um, would just be the um, disease and um, disease vectors. Um, obviously, any kind of commercial composting operation that was composting, um, you know, human and pet waste, uh, they would be doing lots of tests. For example, we test for fecal coliform. We test for salmonella. Um, if we were testing, uh, if we were doing human solids, there's some other, there's some other things that we would be testing for. Um, one issue with composting too much of um, too much waste from especially from carnivores is what happens is um, there's a lot of you know as as top level predators as humans and dogs can be for example or cats um, basically they're bioaccumulators um, so just like you have to be careful how much you know how much tuna fish you eat uh, you need to um, you need to be concerned about mostly heavy metals. That's the real big risk. Um, so biosolid composting, for example, is very heavily regulated, mostly on the heavy metals side, that you can't put too much biosolids into your compost because the heavy metals from human waste is much, much higher than, say, of you know trees uh, or vegetables. Um, so it's something to be concerned about. If you're talking about, you know, your dog, you know, your dog makes a couple buckets of poop a year and you're composting a pretty large amount of material, it's probably okay. Um, these are all, all these things are things that you could test for. Um, your finished compost, you can send it to your local extension agent. Um, Virginia, um, uh, Penn State has one, Virginia Tech. I'm, I'm not sure if they have a compost lab. We use one through um, North Carolina State. And you can do, it's, the heavy metals test is pretty expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars. Um, but they could tell you, for example, if your compost is safe to use. Um, then let's see, um, flies are a problem. Um, flies can be a problem. Um, the best thing that you can do is to really disturb. The problem is that the flies come in so quickly. So like, even if you're just collecting material, if you're collecting material in a bin, um, if there's flies who are who can get into it and lay eggs, once you sort of have a fly population, they can get taken care of, or they can um, they can they can really start to to um, to multiply. Um, yeah, it's there's also nothing wrong with flies. Um, if they really are bothering you, then uh, you know you can you can do something about it. Um, and of course, the other option that I didn't talk about is, you know, all these things are done better at scale. Like if you really want, if you want to do it right, the best possible way would be to use a local compost operation, the commercial compost operation that can go and can process your material really quickly. And then you would buy finished compost from them. So if something like home composting is not what you're looking for, um, there are alternatives as well. All right, it looks like our questions have slowed down. Thank you so much, Noah, for joining us this morning. It was a really great uh, lecture and then following discussion. I'm really glad that our master gardeners are very engaged in the topic. And so thank you, Noah, and thanks everyone who joined us this morning. Great. Thanks, guys.